<laughs> just unmute myself. Um, all right, so it's 12 o'clock. Um, it looks like we have a couple of people filtering in. Um, but with uh, respect to everybody's time, I'm going to get started and start recording. Um, so all of you who are here today know that this will be recorded. Um, or memo newsletter next month in case you want to share it with others or refer back to any of the resources or anything that I go over. So I'm just going to start that recording now. All right. Okay, um, so today we're going, oh, let me go back real quick. So today we're going to talk about the basics of resumes and cover letters. Um, so the very first thing that I want to acknowledge here is that I know all of you who are serving as alumni mentors, you're coming in with a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge about the types of resumes, cover letters, and application materials that are relevant to your field. Um, and I think that that's important to acknowledge because like what I'm going to go over today is going to touch on some of the most common mistakes that I see. Um, so to give you an idea, one of the things that I do every single day is I review our students' documents. So when they submit a resume or a cover letter to Nittany Lion Careers, um, our office reviews every single resume and cover letter that come in from liberal arts students to give them feedback and to approve for use for those, for them to apply to jobs. Um, in addition to reviewing them uh, during appointments and everything like that. So what I want to touch on today are some of some of those basic and common mistakes that we see, um, as well as activities that you can do with your mentees to really help them better understand how employers look at resumes and cover letters and other application materials. Um, and then at the end, what I'll do is I'll go over some of the programming options that we have that you can refer your students to uh, this uh, semester that should be able to help them within their career development as well. Um, so to start, um, what I'm going to go over first is what employers want. Um, then I'm going to go over the overview of resumes, then we'll, I'll touch on cover letters, and then career programming for spring of 2021. Okay, so um, when I do this presentation with students, um, this is the very first slide that I put up for them and the very first slide that I'm going to show you here. So every single year, the National Association of Colleges and Employers um, put out a survey to employers across the United States and ask them what skills and abilities they desire in prospective employees. So if we take a look at the what the results are, are um, from this last survey is you're going to see a lot of transferable skills. Um, so things like leadership or ability to work in a team, communication, um, maybe having like a friendly and outgoing personality or being a risk taker or creativity. And so things like that. And I'm sure that with all of you um, having so much experience um, and serving probably on hiring committees, these might be some of the skills that you're looking for as well, because you can teach some of the intricacies of like um, maybe the type of software that you're using like within your, your office or something like that. Um, but you can't necessarily teach uh, a student or necessarily teach somebody to have uh, initiative um, because those are softer skills that are kind of innate or they grow with the student um, as they like go through college and develop as human beings. Um, so I like to point this this out because when we're thinking about resumes and cover letters and application materials, these are the skills that I really drive home for students to include in those materials. And that is because um, you want to make sure you're connecting with what the employer wants and really tailoring those application materials to what the employer is looking for um, or the graduate program and what the graduate program is looking for. So to give you a little bit of a uh, better of an idea is I like to form Format this to students and using the employer's language and using the vernacular um, and 
taking from the exact job description or program description and putting that directly into the resume or the cover letter that they're writing to help format their narrative and what they want the employer to see that they can do. So um, this management job description, I think I took this off of like monster.com or something like that. Um, so you can see that I've, I've bolded a few of the uh, transferable skills of what employers are looking for, whether it's communicating, planning, coaching, um, being able to coordinate or work with strategic goals. So those are the different types of of language and the language that students and employees or if even if you are going to apply to a different position you should be using in your application um, to connect and to bridge that connect of why you are qualified for the position that you that you are um, another reason why it's really important to use this type of language is because of different AI systems, right? Um, so maybe your organization uses these, maybe they don't, um, but I pulled this statistic from uh, a Deloitte report in 2017 that found that 33% of the of employers already use some form of AI in the hiring process to save time and reduce human bias. So they're already using those, those scans to pick up and make the connection between what is in a student's resume and what they're looking for in the job description and bridge those things. So if students don't have the, that language, they might be bypassed uh, through these different artificial intelligence systems. And I mean, honestly, this report was from 2017, which in research terms is still relevant, um, but, but because technology has so evolved in the last even four years, um, I guarantee that that 33% has gone up a lot. So next comes the resume content. So now that we've kind of talked about how we want to make sure that students are, are using the job description and connecting back to the resume, how do we want to include those different terms throughout the resume? And what does a resume in general look like? Um, so I've just listed here um, that the different content points of a resume and uh, this is going to vary depending on what the student or your mentee um, has on their resume. So some might not have honors or awards, some might not have hard skills or um, activities that they are putting on their resume, things like that. Um, but it's important to kind of look at the content of the resume. So, and it helps me when I'm career coaching and when I'm reviewing a resume that I can just go through this content like a checklist. So if you're reviewing a resume, I recommend like taking a picture or uh, capturing the slide and just going through each point of, okay, do they have appropriate contact information? Is there an objective on their resume? If not, then that's okay, but could it be beneficial? Um, what does their education and experience sections look like? Do they have activities that are relevant um, or irrelevant or leadership that they would like to put on their resume? What types of hard skills do they have? Do they have any honors or awards that would help them stand out? Um, and so by doing this, again, it just kind of, for me, it creates that checklist of like, okay, I'm going through this. Um, and it allows me to communicate that back to the student in a very clear way so they can better understand, okay, these are the exact points and what I need to do in order to make my resume um, stand out um, and all of the components that employers are really looking for. Um, one of the things that I like to also tell students is that your resume is a living document. So like in the world of like social media and um, even LinkedIn, um, I like to kind of equate a resume to that where if you have something on your resume, it's something that you have currently are currently are doing or have done in the past. If you've a if you've accepted a job or accepted an internship, you don't need to put that on your resume right now because you haven't quite done it yet. Um, so that helps students not only kind of view their resume as something that's in the present, 
um, but it also helps them with tenses. So for instance, um, with your with a resume and with the bullet points on a resume, you want to make sure that you have your past experiences in the past tense and your current experiences in the current present tense. Um, so just another kind of uh, thing that I like to do when I'm when I'm coaching students um, to help them better understand like, okay, this is how I want to be formatting my resume and continue to be very detail oriented. Um, so before I go into um, the education and experience section, because like I said at the very beginning, um, I want to really focus on some of the common mistakes that I see um, when I'm reviewing resumes for students. Um, and a lot of them have to do with the education and the experience sections of the resume. Um, I mean, contact information, the the biggest misstep that I typically see within contact information is a student might not have a professional email address or something like that, um, which happens more than not. Um, but the education and the experience sections are really what uh, I tend to hone in on when I'm doing these types of reviews. Um, but before I go into that, I wanted to ask if anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to pop it in the Q&A. Um, I'm happy to answer as we, we go along. I like to make this a discussion. So I'll just pause for a second here to see if anybody has any questions. Okay, so great, uh, great question, Julia. Are objectives necessary? Um, so the answer is no. Um, so a bad objective can hurt you, um, but a good objective isn't really going to help you. It kind of just is. So the way that I explain objectives to students is that you should really only have an objective on your resume if one, you need to fill in space. Um, so like, for instance, maybe students don't have a lot of experiences and they're really looking to kind of fill the full page of a resume, right? Um, an objective can be a really good way to do that. So it'll say something like, to obtain a full-time internship position beginning May of 2021 in the field of marketing or something similar to that. Um, the other reason why I think objectives or the other appropriate way to use objectives is say a student has a lot of experiences, right? Um, but they're kind of like odd jobs where may, they might have worked at a restaurant or they might have worked uh, other part-time positions or they might have uh, maybe leadership ex experience positions in their fraternity or sorority, but it's not directly connected to what they want to do. And they're looking to make that next step of getting an internship or a, a part-time job in their field of interest or getting or obtaining that research position. So that's where an objective can be really helpful is because it can tell the employer or the, or the person looking at their resume that you like even though my experiences don't exactly align directly with what i'm looking for this is what i'm looking for i'm looking for that internship in human resources or something similar if that makes sense um i have seen bad objectives though um and what what stands out to me with a bad objective is when a student kind of uh, rambles on or might have more of a, a professional summary or something like that, um, where it's just, it's taking up a lot of space and they have a lot of really great skills or experiences that I think would better speak uh, in a resume format than kind of like a paragraph up at the top. Because typically employers are only going to look at a resume the first time around for 10 to 15 seconds. They're gonna scan it and then put it in a yes pile as in I wanna look at this a little bit closer or put it in a no pile. So if you have like this big paragraph up at the top, like, I mean, if they have hundreds of resume reviews, they're not resumes to review, they're not gonna look through it. So keeping the objective short and sweet is really key here, um, at least for students. Uh, professional summaries can be very appropriate for um, people who have years worth of experience um, or um, federal resume guidelines, which is a little bit different. So, um, but good question, thank you. Um, all right, yeah, keep the questions coming as I'm going through this. Um, 
So, like I said, I want to focus in on the education section and the experience sections um, to start. So, um, the education section of the resume for students should be pretty much at the very top, right under their contact information or under the objective if the student has one. Um, so, in your education section, you should include a degree or expected graduation date, uh, a GPA if it's above a 3.0. Um, and maybe honors, maybe they've achieved Dean's List or um, something like that. I see a lot of students, if they're in Schreier or if they are a Paterno Fellow, um, putting that type of honors experience up underneath there too. Um, so those are kind of the things that we're looking for within the education section. Um, I see a lot of students, especially those who might not be as confident in their resume, like maybe they haven't had relevant experiences um, throughout their college experience, or maybe they're, they're really trying to fish and fill up that first, like that whole page. They leave high school experience on there, but if they're past their freshman year, the general rule is to take any high school experiences off your resume unless they indicate like a really big accomplishment. So for instance, like say they were valedictorian of their high school class. Well, yes, like obviously like that's something exciting and important that you could potentially keep on there. Um, or if it's directly relevant to the position they, they are going for. So um, to give a for instance, I've seen a couple of students uh, who are interested in research who have participated in like summer research programs over the summers, um, who uh, they are pretty relevant to like what they want to be doing. Um, that would be appropriate to kind of keep on your resume in one of the experience sections below as long as it's relevant. Um, but the general rule is to remove any high school experience, including education after your first year. Um, in the education section as well, uh, relevant courses. So I say anywhere from like four to nine courses is appropriate to keep on your on your resume um, in columns just because it's nice and easy to read. Um, but these again, they're not going to be courses like maybe gen eds or anything like that. They should be relevant to what the student is going for within their career path. Um, so, and it, it shouldn't be the Penn State abbreviation. So like no one outside of Penn State is gonna know what like Econ 102 is. Um, so instead it should list like introduction to microeconomics um, or something like that. Um, study abroad experience, uh, that is also something that you can put underneath your education section or that students should put underneath their education section. Um, global fluency um, is definitely something that employers are looking for um, when it comes to experiences and attributes that they're looking for in potential candidates, um, especially as the world is becoming a more globalized place, right? Um, so study abroad experience, absolutely something to include. So to give you an example of what this could look like um, is you have, this is just a section example of somebody who majored in economics, graduated in May of 2020. Um, they have their Dean's List up there. They also uh, listed their uh, IES abroad experience um, and a couple of relevant courses. So it just makes it a lot easier to read. Um, some things, again, common, like small detail, uh, I, I call it nitpicky mistakes that I often see um, on resumes is that the student will put State College PA instead of University Park. Um, they also uh, might leave out the word the of the Pennsylvania State University. And I know we make fun of Ohio State uh, for that, but um, it's important to include the entire uh, university title on there. Um, so th that's just something common that I, I typically see. Some students also, something I also see is if students have closer to a 3.0 GPA, they'll sometimes leave it off um, because they feel like it's not good enough. 
Um, I've especially seen this with um, students who might originally have been going towards, say, like the Smeal College of Business, and they didn't wind up meeting those entrance to major requirements, and um, their alternative or parallel major was, say, like econ or something related to business and liberal arts. Um, and so they think that, oh, like my, my 3.15 isn't a good GPA, I'm not going to keep it on there. And I have to talk them through and say, no, like that 3.15 is really really good. Um, as long as it's above a three, uh, employers like to see that on your resume because they're looking at you as a whole person and not just as a number, not just as your GPA. Um, so that's something that I often often see with students as, as well. So, all right. Um, so I want to pause here before I go into the experience section of a resume and some of the common missteps that I see. Um, does anybody have any questions that they want to pop in the Q&A? All right, so I'll keep going, but again, please feel free to put them in there. I'm happy to answer. Um, so the experience section of a resume is going to be the bulk of a student's resume typically, right? Um, so this can be a lot of different things, um, but experiences that we know, again, this is through that, that survey um, that I had mentioned at the beginning, um, experiences that are valued by employers are internship experiences, research experience, leadership, volunteer, non-related work experience, and campus and community involvement. So again, like I, I, I see some students and I'm sure that you all probably have a couple of mentees who are unsure or not confident because they might not have that internship experience and maybe they're about to graduate or um, they might not have had like a lot of student org involvement during school um, and there's not a lot of time for them to, to become involved before they graduate and, and apply for, for jobs. Um, so a lot of what I do is again refer back to that activity that I mentioned at the very beginning is well just because you don't have an internship experience like doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to get a job. Um, it doesn't mean that um, you're going to be at like the bottom of the totem pole for when an employer is looking at you. It's can you make the case that the experiences you do have are transferable and relatable to the job that you're applying for or the graduate program that you're applying for, right? Um, and so um, I always give the example of, uh, it's, it's so funny. So students will come to me their, their junior year and they'll say, oh my gosh, Lauren, like I, I, all I did was like work downtown um, at one of the bars um, and I haven't done anything else. Um, I haven't really been involved. And I'll tell them like my own story. I didn't have like any, when I was a, a student here at Penn State, I wasn't really involved. I needed to make money because um, I was supporting myself. So I worked a lot. Um, and I worked at the dining commons um, through my junior year. Um, and I was able to get gain customer service experience. Um, and then I got a work study job on campus um, where I learned like office experience and organization and detail oriented skills. And that's really what helps drive me toward um, a successful application once I graduated to my graduate school experience. And like, so if any of you have those types of experiences, and I'm sure you do, um, where like you can talk with a student about maybe where they're not feeling as confident, um, I really recommend doing that just because it can, it can make them feel a little bit better and it'll give them that confidence, which can increase their motivation to actually apply um, to different jobs and internships, um, which is the important thing, right? Um, so kind of going into this is that we have uh, experience section headings. Um, so this is important because um, this allows the student to order their resume in a way that is tailored to the employer. Um, so, for instance, like one of the common missteps that I see is I'll have students who will only put 
work experience on their resume and in that work experience will be like a part-time busboy job but also a professional internship experience that they had at a law firm um, in addition to like maybe a, a volunteer experience that they did on the side like all under one category and obviously like so if, say they're going to law like they want to apply to law schools like you would want to have that law experience up at the very top of your resume so the admissions committee can see that front and center and everything else kind of acts as a, a supporter right so breaking them up into experience sections can be really helpful um, to kind of draw the employer's eye in a certain order. Um, so with that example for that student, which I, I think I reviewed their resume yesterday, um, I would have related experience, then maybe uh, work experience, and then volunteer experience where they then can kind of go through and elaborate on things that they've done. Um, so a couple on here that you might not be as familiar with um, is I is the second to last one. I have this scholarly works section. Um, so this is a common uh, section that I recommend on students resumes who might not have like an internship experience in their field or related experience in their field. But I mean, they've taken classes, right? And they might have had accumulating project in one of their say econ classes um, where they had to do a case study um, or something like that and work in groups um, and present their findings to the class. So putting this in like a related projects section or a scholarly works section um, can make them feel a little bit more confident confident, sure, but it also is saying like, no, please don't just dismiss my education because I haven't had an internship, but I've really gained something from the classes that I've taken, right? So that's another section that um, I think can be really helpful for students, especially if they don't have anything really related um, to what they're applying for quite yet. So one of the biggest areas that I see um, where uh, some big missteps are in the bullet points of the resume. Um, so oftentimes students will say that they just, they, uh, a, a good example would be for customer service experiences, right? Um, so say they work at the we'll use the dining commons example say they've worked at the dining commons for a couple of years and all they say they've done is serve students um sanitize tables and um maybe worked uh as a team they're, so it's very small where they're not really expanding on what they've done and including not just like their skills that they learn. So in this student's case, it would be customer service, teamwork and organization, right? Um, but they're not giving context to that experience section and they're not showing what they did and what the result was of their action. Um, so to kind of go along with that, to, to best format their bullet points, um, it's really important that they start their bullet points with an action verb. Um, so a really good resource to refer to students to is the career guide, um, the career services career guide, which um, when I send this out to all of you who are in attendance, I'll, I'll include a link to that. They have a page of just action words on action words on action words. So what I'll do with students when I'm helping them format their bullet points is just say, read through all of these action words and see which ones pop out to you. Like, did you mentor? Did you maintain? Did you supervise? Did you exhibit excellent customer service uh, surpassing management standards um, or something like that? Um, so it's, it, having them do that activity can really empower them and make them feel good about the experience that they have on their resume. 
Um, so this is another quick example of why it's really important to, to kind of quantify your experience. So add numbers and qualify it, which means add a result. Um, so for instance, I've, th again, this is a exact example. Um, I've seen students say, okay, I was a legal intern at a law firm and all I did was file documents. Um, but really, so after talking with them and kind of like pulling out information of like, okay, well, what did you actually do when you were filing documents? How many documents did you file? Like, how did this help the law firm? We can come up with a bullet point of managed a filing system for 55,000 confidential records, increasing software efficiency by 10%. And they might not know like what, how exactly they, like the number that they increase that efficiency, but maybe they do know that they increase the efficiency for the firm. So having again, that result at the end of not just what they did, but the result or the why behind what they were doing is really important to kind of make that stand out and connect back to the job description that they're applying for. Um, so this is an example um, that I put together that I, I typically show students. Um, so, um, just so you can kind of see everything nice and neat, um, where you have the name of the organization, the location, the dates that they were there, the title, their exact title, and then what they did while they were there. Um, one of the things and one of the reasons why I'm showing you this right now is because I really want to point out this, the first one up here. So a lot of students that I've worked with, and I know that a lot of your mentees, um, like some of them have had their internship offer rescinded last summer due to COVID-19. So it is completely appropriate for them to put on their resume that their internship offer was obtained and rescinded due to COVID-19. Now, obviously, like that's not going to, it's not going to, I don't want to say it's not going to help them um, because it does, but it, it's not going to stand out as much as, for instance, in this example, like their human resources internship where they actually did the internship and gained that experience. However, I mean, I'm sure all of you know, going through the hiring process, whether it's for an internship or a job is lengthy. Sometimes you're going through multiple rounds of interviews. Sometimes you have to get specific clearances um, or do like different follow-ups. So the fact that they've obtained that offer and because of something completely outside of their control uh, prevented them from having this experience is definitely something to note. Um, so for right now, that is appropriate to put on a resume for a student. Um, that said, like at this point, a lot of employers and recruiters are adapting. They're recruiting for the summer for many of them are remote internships and things like that. Um, so it's important for them, for the students to realize that um, that this is kind of like a temporary thing that's going to be on their resume. We want them to continue and persist on where they're actively applying for internships for the summer. Um, but it also, again, like, I mean, I'll give you a, for instance, I, I've been working really closely with a student who um, obtained the FBI honors internship last year. And it was just such an extensive process for her. And um, a lot of like, I mean, she had to do the polygraph tests. She had to do, um, she had to go through and get a lot of different clearances. She wound up getting the offer but because of COVID she wasn't able to to get that to experience that position it was rescinded so now that she's going into this next recruiting round like she was able to reapply for the FBI uh, honors internship and put on there that she had obtained that internship and then it was rescinded due to COVID-19 um, now who's to say whether she gets offered that internship position again but it can kind of act as that indicator to the employer of oh okay like we already went through all of this with her. This could be something important um, and something that could make our lives easier of, of that selection process. Um, so really quick, just a couple of brief formatting guidelines. And this is gonna be different for federal resumes, which I'll send out a resource about that as well. But um, the margins for a resume should be between one inch and a half an inch. Sometimes I see students, it's so funny. They'll shrink their margins to like the very minimum, um, like the very minimum before uh, it would just fall off the page. Um, so you wanna make sure that the margins are normal. Um, 
their font size, same thing. I've seen some font sizes where uh, students, if they don't have a lot of experiences, they'll put their font size up to like a 14 to 16 point font. And I'm like, that's not going to work. Let's, let's think about how we can fill your resume with intention. Um, and then on the flip side, there are some students who are just overachievers and um, they are like putting their font size down to like an eight point minute font that you can barely read. Um, so then we have to have a discussion of, okay, what is actually relevant here? How can we organize your resume a little bit better and again, make it more intentional? Um, and so for students right now, um, as undergrads, their resume really shouldn't be more than one page long. Um, it's different for, so the, the general rule is the, the more degrees that you have, the, the number of pages that you can add. So for instance, like I know that you, pro there are a couple of you who are probably working with students in um, integrated undergrad to graduate programs. Um, so they might be getting their, at the same time, for instance, their bachelors of labor employment relations and their masters in human resources, right? So technically in that case, because they're getting their masters, they could have two pages, right? Um, again, federal resumes, completely different. Um, I'll send you a really good guideline for that. Um, with federal resumes, you can pretty much have as many pages as you want. Um, so uh, they, they kind of just throw out some of these rules altogether because they're really looking for the detail and the accomplishments and, and things like that. So, but um, for most of our students who aren't applying for different federal types of jobs, it's gonna be that one page. Um, oh, Julia, great question, thank you. Um, so how many bullet points would you recommend for an experience? Um, so for each experience, I recommend having two to five bullet points on there. Um, I hesitate to say less than two, especially if um, it's like an important experience. Um, and this goes for more of like those, those students who might be a little bit more of the overachiever end of things, right? They might have a bunch of different experiences and they're trying to fit everything on there. Um, so at that point, they really need to pick and choose. Um, but students can have up to five bullet points on there. So like anywhere in between. Um, there are a couple of examples. So for instance, say a student has, um, like three or four relevant experiences, but they also had a couple of part-time jobs that they wanna include at the bottom of their resume. If those experiences like at the bottom of their resume aren't as relevant, they can just list them. They don't need to have bullet points at all. Um, so the more relevant I would say is where you really wanna focus in on that, those two to five bullet point ranges. Um, but good question. All right. Um, so here are a couple of helpful resume activities that I, I brainstormed and um, things that I've done before with students. So the first one is to expose students to a lot of resumes. Um, so this like obviously like showing them good resumes can be helpful, but like if you put them like have them put on the employer's hat of, okay, I'm reviewing like 50 resumes here, um, what, like, which resume would you pick out, like, as easy to read to put in the yes pile or the no pile? It can really help them better understand how they scan the resume, um, and it can help them kind of, again, like, adjust their formatting in uh, an appropriate way, right, where the, you're teaching them um, in a way there. Um, obviously, all of you uh, model with your own resume. That's a really good thing to do too. I'll bring mine. Up. I'll bring mine up in appointments sometimes just to show students how you can adjust different headings um, in your resume and and what it can look like. Because, um, for instance, my resume is I think two pages at the ten point font. Um, and some students will say, well, 10 point font, oh my gosh, that's, that's really small. And I'm like, well, no, it's not like, and I'll show them like, this is what it looks like. Um, completely normal. You can still read it. You don't need a magnifying glass. Um, so, and I know all of you, um, who have positions or have gotten into graduate programs, like you've had, your resume has obviously brought you success. So model your own is really important. Um, Go section by section. So again, like using that checklist of, okay, like contact information, objective, education, experience, activity, skills uh, on that, that slide that I had put up earlier um, can be really helpful just for you to kind of keep in the back of your mind. 
Um, incorporate multiple opportunities for feedback. And this kind of re relates down to the last bullet point that I, I put on here. Do you have a colleague um, or somebody else within your field who would be willing to take a look at this, the student's resume? Um, refer them to me. Um, I'm happy. I love meeting with students. I spend about 20 hours a week doing it. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do is to talk about with them um, how they want others to see themselves like through a resume or cover letter, how they want to express their narrative. Um, so refer them to me or another career coach in our office. Um, Katie and Susan are all also uh, wonderful coaches who are, are a really great help. Um, emphasize revision. So like, again, a resume is a living document, right? So it's go you're going to continuously revise it over the course of your life. Um, it's, it's, people aren't stagnant. So your resume isn't going to be snag stagnant. So it's, it's okay for like telling them like, look, it's okay for you to revise this later in the future and kind of helping them through that. Um, so, uh, oh, Linda, this is a, thank you so much. Um, she is, uh, she said, what about referring them to Martin Yates' Knock Em Dead book? He has numerous samples and great suggestions. Yes, um, I've looked at Yates' Knock Em Dead uh, resumes book. Um, highly recommend that. I'll also send out a link to, to that um, after our presentation is, is concluded here. Um, a, a lot of really great samples and suggestions if you need help going through that as well as the career guide that I'll send them out there. So thank you so much, Linda. I appreciate that. Um, the, the next one that I have on here is use an aspirational resume. So this is more so for students who are looking at, um, who might not be as sure. Like I know a few of you are working with students who just aren't sure what they want to do. So like having them create an ideal resume for themselves can not only help them practice with formatting um, that we've gone through today, but it can also help them just like envision, okay, like what do I want my career path to look like in a structured way? Um, so using templates as guides, um, but highly recommending that they create their own I will say I have a love-hate relationship with the Google and uh, Microsoft templates. I think that they are great to start with, but a lot of them don't use the space effectively. Um, so definitely, I think it could it can be a good starting point. But um, like what Linda recommended, the Knock 'Em Dead book and the career guide that I'm going to send you afterward, that has a bunch of different samples um, and resumes that you can use to kind of show them, okay, this is what it should look like. Um, and then again, refer them to a career coach. I'm always happy to help. Um, so another helpful resume activity that I do with them, and I just, I, I think that this is fun. So, um, so one of the things that I do is I'll show them. So I'm a huge fan of The Office. Um, so I, for anybody who's familiar, um, this is one of the resumes that I'll show students during a, uh, like a presentation like this or something similar where I'll say, okay, like pick out what is wrong with this resume. Like what, what could Pam in this particular position like do to elaborate on her experiences? What is appropriate? What is not appropriate on here? And then afterwards showing them a resume and this will be in the career guide that I send you, um, showing them a resume that kind of looks like this, um, which I know is difficult to read the screenshot, um, but how easy it is to read the, the amount of bullet points, like the information that um, Jessica here has on her resume. Okay, so that was kind of my spiel about resumes. I know that that took a while. Um, I have a quick thing about cover letters, um, just like to go through and then I'll focus on spring programming for the rest of the presentation. But does anybody have any questions or comments or even suggestions? I know Linda made a great suggestion for a book that I know that she's used that other mentors have used that can be really helpful with resumes. Um, please feel free to to type in the q and I'll give you just a second. Oh, Julia, another really great question. Um, should students put their address on their resume? Um, so this is something that I'm actually seeing less and less of. And because we're 
in more obviously like right now remote environments um i i really don't think that it's necessary um a phone number and email absolutely um if they feel comfortable putting their address on there sure um i know that if they're maybe they're looking for a position in their hometown or looking for, for a position like where they're currently living then i would say sure like put your put your address on there um just because it can be helpful to say like oh yeah like i already live in the area i wouldn't need any like it kind of indicates i wouldn't need any relocation help or anything like that um but at the same time like as like and we obviously we don't know exactly what the world of work is going to look like after um the pandemic's over but we're moving to more of a remote workforce so i would like again like i i think it's becoming less and less relevant so if a student feels comfortable sure but if not then it's not like the end of the world um i will say that uh resumes um or like the contact information with uh resumes like if they're going for like a federal position or if they're going for a position that might require them to have a clearance i think uh, an address is appropriate to to put on there just because they're going to have to provide that information anyway so good question um oh robin um so she says i always talk about a master resume with students um esp for those who are looking in various paths then pick and choose and tailor to a specific job application absolutely robin so that's actually something that i do as well um and i currently practice too um is that having a master resume with everything on it and then depending on the job description picking and choosing those different experiences to go on the resume that you are actually going to be submitted so thank you robin i appreciate that that recommendation awesome um okay so real quick uh with cover letters so um a lot of students i will say don't know what a cover letter is or haven't necessarily heard of a cover letter. So that's just something to be aware of when you're reviewing or talking about cover letters for the first time um, is I'll often say when I'm doing a presentation like this or when I'm working with a student of I'll say, well, does it require a cover letter or oh, have you heard of what a cover letter is or have you done a cover letter before? And a lot of them will say no. They like I feel like resume is common in our in our language, but cover letters is something new. Um so one of the things that I I do and I think this is I always tell students this is a super easy way to remember what to put in a cover letter and it's also really corny um so it's just easy to remember so i always tell them to use the love letter format um so in your first paragraph you're talking about why you love them so what about the employer what about the position piqued your interest like talking to them to demonstrate enthusiasm um because i always say like well if you're going to write a love letter to someone you want to focus on them first and not you um so in that in this case you want to make the employer feel special um you want to show them like why them specifically that you did your research on the employer in the position the next paragraph is i say why why they should love you so this is going to be the bulk of it so i always tell them well like it's the bulk of it because you know more about yourself than the employer right now so here you're going to talk about what what their needs are um like based on the job description and based on like the research that you've done but you're connecting your experience and interest to those needs right you don't just want to repeat your resume you want to put this in more of a narrative format and you want to add a little bit of personality so saying things that oh i enjoy this about my past positions or this is something that i'm really um i find purposeful or something that has brought a lot of meaning to what i'm doing in my career path um so uh that that would be the second paragraph um is again just connecting that experience and your interest to their like what you believe their needs are 
Um, and then the last paragraph is a summary statement of why you should be together. Um, so this is where you're thanking them for their time and consideration. But I always like to say like, okay, like you're, you're pulling, you're gaining a little bit of power. You're taking some of that power back in this statement because you're going to summarize, okay, why, if they hire you, are you going to be a good fit for them? But also why are they going to be a good fit for you? Like, how is this going to contribute to your overall professional goals? Because not only does that, again, give the student a little bit more power and feel a little bit more confident, like this is an active decision for them, um, but it's also showing the employer that they've, again, done their research and um, that they're serious about the position because like, obviously an employer wants that symbiotic relationship where it's it's a give and take right like um it helps with retention and and all of those different things um so this is just a fun way i like to to format a cover letter i think it's a, a simple easy way to remember um this is just a a sample that i typically use during this presentation for students um in the career guide that i'm going to be sending you they have a bunch of different examples and formats of it should be in a business letter format um uh and it'll go through like each of the particulars of what they should include um within each of those okay um, so any questions before I go into the career programming for spring of 2021? Or any suggestions? I mean, we all like all of you in attendance are mentors. I'm sure that you have your own tips and tricks that you could share with those who are in the audience as well. Well, so I'll keep going, um, but please, if you're typing, keep typing, and um, I'm happy to read that aloud. Um, oh, Linda, okay, thank you so much. Um, Yates has a book on cover letters too. So Martin Yates, the Knock 'em Dead um, author, has a book on cover letters as well. So um, thank you, Linda. I'll include that in the email that I send out to all of you after this presentation as well. So thank you. All right, um, so for career programming, so um, I wanted to make sure to go over this uh, during this hour because <clears throat> um, we have a ton of programs going on, a ton of career programs that I highly recommend you uh, refer your students to. They're very beneficial. Our assistant director, Katie, she does a majority of the programming and she has put together some really awesome speakers, presenters, info sessions uh, for this year. Um, so the first thing that's going on is this week is actually liberal arts career week. Um, so we had uh, on Monday, we had one presentation yesterday, we had a couple on graduate programs on um, for PhD and master's students looking to go into industry. Um, today, we actually have a couple going on too. So one's going on right now of what can I do with my major um, for liberal arts students. Um, tonight, um, we actually have three mentors um, who are also mentees as students during undergrad um, serving on a panel about what mentors are and why students need one. Um, and then Deloitte is going to be talking about the workforce of the future. Uh, tomorrow, there is an event um, at over noon, the noon hour on diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and then we have employer office hours. Um, and then on Friday, uh, we are talking about gap year, is it just a vacation? Um, so that's what's going on for the rest of this week. So all of these, all of this information can be found on Nittany Lion Careers. Like every single program that I'm going over right now can refer your students to Nittany Lion Careers or to the events, the liberal arts events page. And I will also include both of those links in the follow-up by email I send you this afternoon. Um, so February, we have a couple of really cool things going on. Um, we have virtual office hours um, for Ferguson Township. Um, Center Helps is having an information session. Um, Katie's put together a lunch and learn on careers in advocacy. Um, on February 9th, the university, so I'm not sure if all of you have heard, um, but we're not, so the university decided to cancel spring break this year, which is why the students started a week late. Um, and instead are doing wellness days throughout 
once per month. So February 9th is the first university wellness days. Um, so uh, the 10th, we have an information session on the NGIC. Um, the 11th is a career conversation um, for international nonprofits and local developments. Um, Politico is having an info session on the 17th and then when the State Department is doing a couple things for us at the end of the end of the month. Um, I'll just put in a plug here too. If any of you are like, feel like you would want to do some type of lunch and learn or career conversation presentations um, based on like what you do, um, if there, if you feel like you would want to come and speak to students in one of these capacities, like please send me an email, let me know. We're always looking for, for alumni speakers um, because I feel like students can especially relate to, to uh, you all as, uh, as alumni. Um, okay, so in March, um, spring career days, so the spring career fair got pushed back to the first week of March. Um, we're, there's careers in freelance writing on March 4th. Um, two uh, presentations for students working who are looking to work in Philadelphia and Seattle featuring alumni as well. Um, the impact fair, so for students who want to go into nonprofit work um, and uh, those different types of helping and service professions is on March 10th. Uh, another university wellness day on the 11th. Um, and then we have a career conversation with um, actually one of our alumni mentors who's working in the Ukraine um, is doing a career conversation on translation and interpretation. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be at like 2 a.m. his time um, as he's doing it, which is pretty cool. Um, a few virtual office hours, uh, and then we have a virtual lunch, uh, learn and network in DC program at the end of March. And then in April, we're winding down. So we have uh, careers in academic uh, programs of the State Department, another university wellness day, senior week is the 12th through the 16th. And then uh, on the 14th, we have career conversations and mental health careers. Um, I feel like a the end of April is gonna be here before we know it, so. Um, and then real quick, senior week. Um, so this is something that we do for graduating seniors. So if you have any uh, senior students who are graduating this May, um, definitely refer them to this th these programs. Um, so we have a couple of different programs going on that are focusing on what next, like after graduation. Um, and we also do this in ties with our post-grad survey to get them to fill out where they're going. So we have that data on record um, in order to one, better understand how the pandemic is affecting job placement, um, but two, so we can get in contact with them afterwards if they wanna become alumni mentors afterwards too, so. All right, um, so I am going to um, uh, open it up again for questions. We have about three minutes left. Feel free to um, type it in the chat. Um, we have an alum who typed in the, uh, in the Q&A that uh, if anybody has a student who is looking at, at the Department of Defense and they might not have government experience, feel free to give her a holler. Um, this is Robin Whalick. Um, she was a hiring official at the Pentagon and would be happy to assist. Um, so thank you so much, Robin. So like if any of you in attendance like need help with that, um, please feel free to email me and I can uh, pass along Robin's uh, information. All right. All right, so I will end it here. Um, please feel free, my, my email address is listed on here. Um, so feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. I'm going to, again, I'm going to send you all the uh, follow up information with a couple of helpful links, um, the PowerPoint, um, as well as some other information in the recording of this uh, after uh, this afternoon. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Um, I will stop the recording here. Um,